every time was going to be the last time. Never again, I don't need it, I don't want it. And yet there are systems being established in your brain and in your thinking um, and how you're dealing with life that just continue to take you back. Welcome to the Focus on the Family broadcast, helping families thrive. Nick and Michelle, welcome back to Focus. Yeah, Thanks great to be us. here. Um, man, some difficult stuff, but yeah, the one thing, just watching the two of you interact, you've really come a long way. You can tell your love and affection yeah. for each other, even through difficulty, which I find the greatest point of hope for couples who are struggling with this. It's natural. It's, uh, I think, reasonable to want to say, I'm done. Whether you're the wife mm-hmm. uh, that has suffered through a an addiction by her husband or vice versa. It it just seems like the easy way out. But Mm -hmm. I'm telling you, most couples that I have met that have fought through this battle have great intimacy emotionally, certainly physically, uh, and spiritually. There's something about fighting for your marriage in this way that there must be a sense of honesty that you both possess that really builds a better foundation than what you first had. Yeah, well, and it forces you to face all of your deepest issues uh, as individuals and as a couple, and if you face them and work through them rather than run from them, uh, God does produce something even more wonderful. And we definitely refer to our marriage as before and after. You know, the 10 years before this process and the eight years after, they're, they're so different. It is like night and day. It's, mm-hmm. it's the before and after. two different after. episodes, it at really least, is. if not two different types of marriages, yeah. right? One that's built on falsehood, the other built on truth. Mm-hmm. And that's a good thing. And Nick, let me kick it off. In the book, you mentioned something about the gift of pain, that you believe this ended up being a real positive thing, the way you're describing it. But you called it the gift of pain from God. Now, yeah. we Westerners aren't used to putting it in that context. Yeah. Yeah, it was uh, in 2010, so we'd been married for 10 years at that point, and in my pattern of confession to her, which was happening, you know, once or twice a year where I'd get up the courage and feel guilty enough, I would kind of share that things were still happening, Um, and I would always uh, excuse or minimize my behavior to say, it's not about you, you know, this has been in my life long before I met you, so it's not a reaction to your beauty or lack of sex, things are great there. And so I would say it to her to say, if you only understood, you wouldn't be angry or upset because it's not about you. Hmm. And the, the gift of pain was on this time in 2010 when I had relapsed, as I imagined myself needing to tell her yet again that I'd crossed those lines, the pain I, wa- I was feeling wasn't my pain. It wasn't like, man, she's going to be mad and have to go through this again. I think it was for the first time I could see in advance the pain it was going to cause her. Um, and it was heartbreaking to realize I would do this to someone I care about so much, and I, I could feel the way it was going to make her feel, because we'd been through this enough times that I, I could hear the words she was going to say, and, and I was feeling her pain. And I think that's what really opened my eyes to say, this, this is uh, a major issue that I have to address. I can't just keep excusing it to say, oh, it's getting better, I'm working on it, like, if I'm causing someone I love this much pain, I've got to be willing to do whatever it takes to stop it. What what year was this in your marriage? Uh, uh, year 10. So this is year 10. I mean, think of that battle. And this is when you first become empathetic to Michelle's heart. Yeah. Um, some people go, wow, are you dense? What happened there? Well, addiction but, dials But down I appreciate the fact that you got there. Yeah. Let's look at the positive side yeah. of it. But answer both of those kind of emotional responses. Yeah, you know, really when we're involved in any behavior, again, whether it's pornography or a food addiction or drug, it's actually a way of kind of numbing our emotions. And you can't dial down one emotion in your life. So if 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 you're feeling lots of shame and rejection and fear, and so you're acting out to kind of numb those emotions, then you're also dialing down the emotions, the healthy ones that you need for a good marriage. And so I think what I was seeing in my life is what we see for so many men and women that struggle in this area is they don't have much empathy. And Again, that's why I think of it as such a gift from God, because somehow by his Holy Spirit that night in 2010, he just he broke through, and I, I felt things I'd never felt before. That, yeah. that someone listening might think, well, why didn't you feel that every time? And I would say, I, I don't know. I wish I had. Yeah, that's Because we probably could have um, launched onto this journey of healing a lot sooner. Well, and Michelle, I, you know, turning to you, you got tears in your eyes, you're <laughs> welling up, and that's a good thing. It's okay, because you know a lot of women are in your corner reliving this thinking what was going on why were you putting up with this what you know what was happening for you emotionally i love this man and he's great dad and he's an amazing pastor and i just didn't know why 
God wasn't freeing him from this struggle. You know, that was my prayer. Like, God, we're both wanting out of this. Like, why aren't you helping him? He's doing everything. We knew what to do. Well, and at this point, you had had enough. And at 10, yeah. So at this point, he'd called me. And I think for every woman, there's a breaking point. Like, you, you, you know, try to fix him. You try to get counseling or whatever. You try to you know, make it work. But then there's like this breaking point of this is going to be my forever. Am I okay with that or not? And then you either stay or you leave. There's like this heart connection that just kind of breaks, I guess. Let me ask you, because again, I so appreciate your transparency. It's, it's refreshing. It's so healthy, but what did it feel like? I mean, to know that Nick was, you know, coming back to you a couple times a year saying, you know, I blew it. I looked at things. I saw things. However, that was expressed. Yeah. I mean, as a woman, what did it feel like? It it felt like, um, I kind of refer to it, I think, like as like knife cuts, like where, you know, he like hurt you and like you're bleeding out and like then they'd heal and there, but there was a scar left. Huh. But there were, that was just over and over and over, and there wasn't much life left at the end of 10 years to give yeah. back, to keep working. So well, my, I'd kind of decided, like, okay, I'm going to figure out how to move to where my parents were, live with them. and So you began to think of your escape plan. To think, yeah. yeah, and then I was like, well, well, that's not fair to the kids. I can't, you know, take their dad away from them. So when the kids are gone... I'm out. <laughs> well, and I know every time I'd confess, you would tell to me that it made you feel like you weren't good enough, like you had to compare to these images. Right. And even though I would say it's not about you, right. that wasn't your reality. Well, and that was the reality. point there yes. because it, that was the feeling question I had. Because even right. though Nick may have been saying that, right. you had to feel oh, yeah, I fill felt in the blank. Inadequate, not, enough. Yeah. not enough. Why am I not enough? I don't understand why I'm not enough. Because it, from him, it was separate. For me, it wasn't because for, I think for a woman, in order to do the acts that men do to their wives, we would have to hate them to do those things. But for men, it's, it's so separate. It's not, we compartmentalize. it's not, yeah. beca- there's, it, they almost, it's not even about you. But for us, it's like, how could it not be about me? It's a fair question. So. Uh, Nick, in the book, you talk about the two Nicks. I think you describe it that way and, and the sinful Nick and the good Nick, you know, the one that wants to pursue the Lord and be holy and live a life that's pleasing to him. Yeah. Um, what was God speaking to your heart in that moment about the two Nicks? Yeah. I mean, I think every man knows exactly what you're talking about. Yeah, I think we I call it the public me and the private me. It's like the me I want you to see and that I believe I am, and the private me is where I'm dealing with sin and brokenness and stuff I don't like. Um, and the real danger, uh, and what I discovered, is we can convince ourselves that the public me is the real me, that that's, that's the best version of us, that if we could just get rid of all this other junk, we could be that. In fact, you ask God to destroy that private Nick. Yeah, because it feels like somehow that's not us, but I, I remember I was, I was out running and just feeling so broken by it and asked God to take it away. And it was one of those few moments in my life I just really clearly felt I heard his voice, not, you know, audibly, but but just that whisper in my soul of saying, but that's the Nick I died for. Mm. And and to know that he loved me in that part of myself and to become open to the idea that maybe that broken, struggling part of my life was actually more authentically me than anything I was publicly presenting mm. as this cleaned up persona was really an eye-opening part of this journey. And that is, as I look back to see how God worked through that, that all of that brokenness was actually revealing um, where God's design had been corrupted. And as he was able to bring in his truth in an experiential way and rewrite some of that faulty thinking, um, it, it really brought me alive. And what I feel happened, it begins to destroy that public me, private me divide. Yeah, we, like don't, we don't need to have both. Yeah. We need to be able to just be in public who we are in private and not fear that that we'll be rejected for it. We just need to be vulnerable and humble and allow God to keep transforming us from the inside out. Mm. You're describing a tension point. You've been touching on this for some time now uh, in our conversation today. There's, there's Paul in Romans talking about, you know, I'm a sinful man and I do the things I, I don't want to do, and I can't quite straighten it all out. Um, did you identify with Paul's writing as you struggled, as you confessed, as you came back to that sin? Um, what was... What relationship did you have with that passage of Scripture? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I think Romans 7 describes the, the plight of anyone 
battling some sort of besetting sin that's like it's there and the harder I try it seems like the more it comes back you know and then declaring with him the victory of who will set me free thanks be to Jesus Christ our Lord who leads us in victory and and that hope of one day I'll, I'll really be able to say those words with conviction because one day I'll be free one day there'll be victory but right now I'm stuck in the why do I do what I don't want to do mm-hmm. um, and and in fact that was part of when we shared our story with our congregation um, referencing that passion passage to say, I feel like I've lived this passage for a number of years, even as your pastor, and asked for their forgiveness, asked for their help in starting groups for men and women that struggled, and and tried to create an environment to say, this is the human predicament, not just for a few of us, that couldn't we all look at our lives somewhere and say, in spite of my best intentions, I do the things I don't want to do. Yeah. And it, it opens our eyes to, to see this isn't about just pornography or sexual sin, but really, where do we as humans get off the mark, and what does recovery and healing look like? I think that is critical, and maybe the most important point that I was hoping we would make today, and that is the unhealthiness of the church where we hide these things and we don't look at them, and therefore they happen uh, in secret, and we're not healthy. Whereas uh, projecting brokenness rather than perfection would actually help draw people to Christ, Mm -hmm. that we're not super people, that we're broken people, that need we need God's grace. Yeah. And I I do applaud you for that. You know, I've got mixed emotions about (laughs) remaining in the pastorate and not stepping out. That one I struggle with that in part. And I hope you can feel why or know why. But I love the outcome, the fact that you were able to teach your congregation about the brokenness in your own soul and how it represents kind of everybody else, too. I mean, 68% of Christian men struggling with this, that that right there suggests something that we're not dealing with. And so I I really do applaud that. Has your church, has that borne fruit as you started these groups? Do you feel the church, your church, is healthier because of it? Oh, yeah. Yeah, Mm -hmm. absolutely. You know, if I could speak to the tension you brought up there just a little bit, that Every story is different, and is it appropriate to remain in ministry? Um, Those are questions that can be answered at the church level, where someone's story is being known by an elder board. But what I look back on is I really applaud my denomination, because they stepped forward at one of our district events to say, we recognize these stats are true, that there are a number of you in this room that this is your struggle, but you're in this double bind that you feel if you confess it, you'll be fired, but in not confessing it, you're forced to struggle alone, and you can't get free that way. So they stepped forward and said, we want to help you if you're struggling, if it hasn't crossed lines into something illegal or with other people, and we're going to work alongside of you for healing to get into a counseling program, and we're going to work alongside your board to keep you in ministry. Um, And that really created this culture to say, it's okay to not to have this struggle, it's okay to confess it because they wanted to help, not punish. Right. And um, that that gave me some freedom to pursue it, um, having had that track record with my board of having confessed it a few times. It wasn't a total shock to them, so we were able to to progress through it. Um, And I I really think that laid the groundwork for our church because it wasn't like we were a a totally judgmental church that overnight became a grace-filled church. I I think there was a desire to be gracious, uh, but still the subject of pornography or sexual sin was the taboo topic, as it is in so many churches. And when the lead pastor, and this is where I think Um, for pastors that are able to address their own sexual history, that are able to address their own brokenness, the tool that gives them to transform churches, because when one of your leaders, or maybe even your senior leader, steps up and says, I've been a human being in this area that's been struggling, I've found some freedom, the way that communicates to the rest of the church, and we would get this, you know, after I would preach those first weeks after our disclosure, you know, people had warned me, oh, you'll have people leave, they can't handle that level of authenticity, it'll be too much. If anyone left, to this day, I still don't know that. But what we had for weeks after week after week was people coming up, usually with tears in their eyes, saying thank you. Because yeah. if you can be real about this issue in your life and be the pastor, then me too. Then I know it's safe for me to be real. And it opened up so many people's stories. I mean, people you would if, if I gave you an hour to guess which people in our church struggled with sexual sin, you would not have guessed some of these men. Interesting. But because mm-hmm. it, it was started from the top, that vulnerability and the realness, 
they were able to come to me and say, no one knows, and they, they would say literally, no one knows this, yeah. but I need to deal with it. And, and we saw a change happen that was truly remarkable. And I think that's the, the, the proof in the pudding, right? I mean, right there. That's why I wanted to know how your church is doing with that. You mentioned this issue of shame. And I, I want to go from maybe a macro perspective as we've been talking about it, what happens in the church, what happens in your marriage, to what I would consider even more of a micro perspective as a parent. And where we make a mistake in our parenting of particularly our teenagers because they can feel that shame when yeah. they've done this, when they've looked at something, and yeah. the parents, Christian parents, mm -hmm. find out about it. This is a moment you have to react very carefully. What coaching would you give the parent to say, let's be open and honest here. This is how I would go about it. Yeah. Well, you know, fear and shame go together. And so because as parents were fearful of our kids falling into this kind of behavior or, or finding things, then when it comes up, we often react in a shaming way to say, what were you doing? What were you thinking? How could you do that? What's wrong with you? And, and we're, it's coming from a good place where we want to protect them and we want to help them. But what we communicate to them is there's something wrong with you for wanting to do this. So my advice to parents is always to start with their faith, to start with God and say, you know, God designed us for sex. God made us with hormones that, that find these things attractive. But let's look at how our culture twists it and, and the things that maybe you're stumbling into so that it's an open conversation where we acknowledge they've got legitimate emotions and hormones and feelings that doesn't make them bad or evil or perverted. Um, if you can create that kind of dialogue with your kids where they know mom and dad are the safest people on the earth to bring these things up to, mm. then they're going to keep bringing it to you. Mm. But if, if you find something on their phone and your reaction is, what were you thinking? Well, are they going to want to bring that up next time? No, they've just learned, okay, mom and dad are not the place to bring this up because they'll just get mad and I'll feel worse. Uh, so as parents, we have to create environments like I was talking about in our church where a teenager, and it starts even before teenage years, where your grade school kids know it's okay in this home not to be okay. That mom and dad, yeah, there might be discipline. There's still rules. It doesn't mean we just throw all that out the window. But we create an environment of dialogue with our kids, of confession, of honesty, of vulnerability. And it also has to start with us where we're willing to go to our kids and say, Dad made a mistake. The way I treated you today, that was wrong. I got angry, and it wasn't about you. I was thinking about work, and I was already yeah. frustrated. And when they see that vulnerability in us, then they can be vulnerable. So parents really have to model it uh, if they want to see it in their kids. And I've noticed just conversations I hear with moms and stuff, they're scared to talk about anything sexual or, you know, my kids saw this on YouTube and they're, they're scared. And What's so that protection? Protection. Yeah. They're, they're worried. And I think in this generation, you have to just develop a conversation with your kids. That's just, they can always trust you and they know yeah. that they can come to you yeah. and be open. That's so critical. Yeah. Hey, let's get to the bow of the story. Cause it's so beautiful. Um, 10 years, we've gotten to that point, all the angst, and I appreciate, again, your vulnerability to share that. Let's talk about how the Lord tied this together when you did make that final decision to say it's done. Both of your reactions, the role that Pure Desire Ministries played in that regard, the one you now lead and took over from, mm -hmm. I think, the founder. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> just describe that for us and the fact that you're in a much better place now. You're helping hundreds, if not thousands, of people with this uh, sexual addiction problem. Tell us what happened. Yeah. Well, um, admittedly, I, I still was so minimizing, I didn't think I needed it. But Michelle heard those same words of invitation to get help, and she knew we did. And so I took this intermediate step to go meet with a, a counselor friend in our district um, who asked me really three life-changing questions. Because I said, I don't think I need, I just need a little bit of tips how to avoid pornography. But he said, Nick, let's think about this. Number one, how long has this been in your life? Wow. So by that time, it had been over 15 years. Yeah. He said, okay, number two, how many times have you tried to stop? And I actually chuckled because I said, well, <laughs> every time has been the last time. So I've tried to stop literally hundreds, if not thousands of times. Right. And he said, okay, and is it causing you or people you care about significant amounts of pain? And I said, well, yeah, I believe if I don't change, my wife will leave me. And he yeah. said, well, put that together, Nick. It's been a problem for a while. You've tried repeatedly to stop and can't, even though it's causing you or people you love pain. I said, yeah, that's pretty good description. <laughs> he said, Nick, that's a clinical definition of addiction. And I, I remember I, I sat back in my chair mm -hmm. like he'd sucker punched me because I was a pastor. 
And it was I, the first I, time it came together. I for truly you. loved the Lord with my whole, I mean, as, as much as I knew how to love him with my whole heart. And the idea that I could simultaneously be that and be an addict was as foreign to me as, you know, the German language would be if I tried to speak that. Like, that language was so bizarre. But when I allowed that to sink in, the openness of maybe this is why I can't just stop it on my own. Um, and gave me the willingness to go down and meet with Ted and Diane Roberts. And we got to go together, which I think was so important that that from the get-go, they worked with us as a couple um, so we could deal with her, my wife's pain and sense of betrayal and the lack of trust and then also the behaviors in my life. Um, and, and we met with Ted and Diane Roberts and started to go through the counseling process. And probably the most significant thing they required of us was to be in a group, um, which I also did not want to do because I already had... Saturday night services and elder meetings and small group, and who needs one more nightly commitment a week? But uh, Dr. Ted said to me, if you don't do this, you won't change. Wow. Because he saw the central role community has to play in recovery. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I went to a group. Um, I didn't like it at first, but um, I found about eight or 10 weeks in as we're going every week that one night as I was driving up, I'll I'll just tell this one part of the story and then Michelle can kind of share hers. Uh, I was driving up to my group and I realized I'd been looking forward to it all week. I thought, this is so bizarre. I'm going to a place where people know the very worst things about me. I've told them things I've never told anybody else, and I can't wait to get there. Hmm. What is going on? And again, it was one of those moments I heard the voice of the Lord just whisper to my soul. He said, Nick, it's the only place in your life you feel real. Hmm. And I realized that was it, that everywhere else I was so involved in that public me that I felt like if people knew, they'd reject me. But in that group, they knew the private me like no one else ever did. And I was a part of that group. I was loved and accepted. And it was that group that really, along with the counseling, created such transformation where I knew I didn't have to posture or pretend anymore for love. Um, And when you experience that from other people, that's where I think I most deeply experienced the love of God. Yeah. That I'd been a pastor for 10 years, and I knew um, knowledge-wise, head-wise, all about the love of God. I could preach about it. But I don't know that I'd ever really experienced it because of that voice of shame that said people would reject you. When I experienced the love from those other men, that's where the love of God became real. Yeah. And so from then, marriage and ministry became ministering out of the love of God rather than ministering in a hope that I might achieve the love of God. And that was a night and day change for me. So, Well, and that, that's the common phrase about being known. And that is, that is the Christian life, that God loves you even though he knows you. Mm-hmm. And I think it's hard for us to believe that he truly knows us. We try to hide those places. Yeah thinking that the creator doesn't know us. Yeah. I mean, it's kind of idiotic. Or we know he knows, we just think he has a very disapproving opinion of most Correct. of Correct, even worse, <laughs> he's got the club. All right, Michelle, so your, your best so, day. <laughs> my best day. Well, that was one of them. When Pure Desire came and they were up there telling about this program, I was bawling. My eyes were like biggest saucers, like, this is it. Lord has answered my prayer today. Like, <laughs> This is There's it. Hope. This is what's going to save our, my marriage. And then I look over and he looks over at me and I'm just, you know, crying. And to hear him not, like, not realize that he was going to be all in. <laughs> right. It's still kind of like surprising. Like, why wouldn't you be running up there and like, pick me? Um, that was a big, important day. And then um, meeting with Ted and Diane was wonderful. Um, I didn't want to go to a women's group, though. I had little kids at home. And you were both busy. I was <laughs> thinking, It's so funny to hear you guys both talk like that. Why do I need a group? This is his problem, yeah. you know? But then going through, it's called Betrayal and Beyond Women's Groups, and seeing all the other women there, all Christian women, whose husbands struggle with this, or some husbands have left, but they're there working on, you know, their stuff, and to hear all their stories and all our stories are so different, but it all, we all feel the same pain. The, mm. We all feel the similar Same material, realities. same cloth, but different stitch. Yeah. yeah. It was just like, whoa. And just to see all of us feel so um, like not enough. Yeah. And I think that's just the way that Satan gets to us is like, you're not enough. Yeah. Um, you know, it's so impressive the, the, the way you highlight community and the importance of being vulnerable in a group where you can be real. I mean, that came through loud and clear the last few minutes and how few people actually experience that today in, in modern mm-hmm. uh, community. I mean, it's just yeah. so fast, everybody's busy. How are you? I'm great, how are yeah. you? And mm-hmm. the nature of sexual sin, it isolates us. And yeah. so when we try to fix it in isolation, 
that doesn't work. And we want to yeah. be better and not have anyone know about it. But the pathway to being better <laughs> is having other people know about it and be part of that journey with us. Yeah. Talk to the uh, length of time to get counseling, to work mm -hmm. on these things intentionally. Uh, what was that period of time like? How long was it with counseling and help? Yeah, initially, the what I would kind of call the intense change process was about a year long of the counseling and being in groups. Um, but the healing continues. Uh, you know, the second time of going through the group material where I got to lead it in my church and help other men, I was still learning so much about myself mm. because really that first year in some ways is like triage where we're stopping That's the bleeding true. and the pain and figuring out how to arrest the behavior. You know, the behavior in my life actually changed very quickly, but the underlying issues those things don't change overnight. And so it was, a, it was a full two to three years of working through performance and shame and guilt that, um, that occurred. And that's what we really try to encourage people to see is this change isn't something you can do in a five-week study yeah. or read a good book mm -hmm. and you'll be okay. Um, it's funny to say that as the author of a book, but, um, <laughs> yeah, really. but to really take the long view to see if these are issues that have developed in my life over years and maybe decades, it may take a year or two of intentional work to un unravel what's gone oh, on. Yeah, I mean, and, and I it, think that's pretty fast paced. Yeah, and it'll take the wife about two to five years to rebuild that trust and. Yeah, mm -hmm. boy, that's work on that. that's encouraging and discouraging. Yeah. But yeah. and it's I had true. to actually go through book one twice because the first time I was pretty numb. Like I yeah. just wasn't. I didn't have much feeling. I think that's how I coped with our right. struggle. Is I just numbed out to it all. Yeah, and that so, again is reasonable. Yeah. So that's a process for for the victim in this case, the spouse. Yeah. Who's, experience that. So, boy, this has been so good. Uh, I hope you, the listener, you have appreciated what Nick and Michelle have done here. They have laid their life out to mm -hmm. maybe two, three million people through Focus on the Family, and that takes great courage, and I so appreciate it. And uh, I'm telling you, John, our phones should be ringing off the hook mm -hmm. for people who want to get counseling help, and I hope you'll do that. You're not going to shock us or surprise us. This is us. Yeah. This is humanity. This is what God is um, believing in us that we can do better, live for him in authentic ways. And I appreciate your model. I really do. Nick, I can't imagine the pressure you must have felt being the pastor facing very straightforwardly this issue. And that takes incredible courage. And Michelle, I'll give you credit. It takes more courage to be his wife, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. to be blunt, and yeah. to suffer through that for 10 years. Yeah, she's the real hero. Yeah, and I, you know, I applaud you. And I would really, um, to the best of my ability, to encourage a wife particularly mm -hmm. to fight for her marriage, not right. to give up. Right. That God is honored mm -hmm. in fighting for it. And, um, you know, try to make the right moves. Mm -hmm. And he may be a rascal. He may have done some things that really hurt. Mm -hmm. But get on that journey of healing. And, uh, man, I think when you go through that, you are a powerful couple for mm -hmm. Christ. Because mm -hmm. there's no hidden nothing. Yeah, the mm -hmm. enemy wins when we're alone. But when we start to tell our story, and that's why we do this. We tell our story because we know that if it brings other people out of hiding, right. that the Lord can begin to win. Mm -hmm. And... You know, the enemy only can win it by subtraction, by one at a time, isolating us. Right. The Lord wins by multiply, multiplying healing. That's good. And so the victory can come a lot faster. Mm. Yeah. And I was thinking about the sec my second favorite part was when he disclosed to our church because it was all, I didn't have to carry that burden alone anymore. I bet it was an yeah. exhale for you. It could be like Galatians 6. Yeah. Where we carry each other's burdens together. Well, isn't that the, so. the way to do it? Thank you so much for being with us. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Yeah, absolutely. Hey, I'm John Fuller, and thanks for watching. Get more info about Focus over here and more from our guests over there, and be sure to subscribe to our channel as well.